Games rated E to M. Welcome to Nintendo Power Podcast. This episode, we look back on 30 years of Super NES, its best games, and our favorite memories. My name is Chris, and this episode I'm joined by Sam from Nintendo Treehouse. Hi, Sam. Hello. And David from the communications team at Nintendo of America. Hi, David. Hey. Now, this is a really special month for me because 30 years ago, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System launched in the U.S., and the Super NES is one of my all-time favorite consoles, so that I thought it would be really fun to share our stories about the system and, and our favorite games, so should we just jump right into it? Sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. So, you know, to start things off, Sam, when you think about Super NES, what comes to mind? Oh, goodness. Um, one of my earliest memories of the system is actually when I when I got the Super NES. Um, when um, when my dad would get home from work, he would bring us like a Ghostbusters figure or something like that. You know, the real Ghostbusters cartoon was on at that time. We were really into it. And every now and then he'd bring us a toy. Uh, but I remember coming home from school one day, and my dad was already home, which was rather unusual. And he said that he had a surprise for us. And uh, we, we didn't know what it was, but, you know, we were expecting something on the level of, like I said, you know, a Ghostbusters toy or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or something like that. So he said he had hidden it somewhere in the house. And my brother and I, we tear off. We start running all over the place looking for, for, what, for what this could be. I remember looking under the couch cushions on the couch. My brother's, like, in the oven, in the kitchen. And for whatever reason, we, we never went into our bedroom. Uh, we shared a room at the time. And uh, I don't know if my dad had to kind of prompt us to lead us in there or what. But um, I remember when we went into the bedroom, there was um, on top of our little white dresser, there was a small 13-inch CRT TV and hooked up to it was the Super NES and Super Mario World was already inside and it was running that sort of title screen, that attract screen. And, you know, that was, if I think about kind of pivotal moments in my history, you know, like a moment that sort of changed everything and set my life on a different course, that's got to be one of them. I mean, that was, that was the day that we got the Super NES. I was pretty young, so I don't remember what the exact timing was, but I feel like it was probably around launch if I'm trying to put together context clues for what games were available and other things that we might have borrowed from friends at the time, it, it had to have been right around launch. And yeah, that's, that's what I think of when I think of the Super NES. It's kind of like the, the beginning of my gaming journey. It, it was my, my first console. That's amazing. What a cool dad. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that is, what a surprise. That's a lot better than anything you could have found under those couch cushions for right, sure. Right. Right. No, it was it was a total surprise. I don't I don't remember ever like asking him for it. It was it was just totally this left field thing that that ended up being like, you know, like I said, this 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 shift in the course in the course of everything that happened after. So yeah, it's a, it, that was a, that was a big moment for me. Well, that's awesome. And David, I think you started working at Nintendo right before the Super NES era started, right? So what was that like? Oh, I did. You know, I started in 1990. Actually, it was about to, it was in August of 1990. So this the the Super NES came out about uh, a year after I'd been there. And you know, we at Nintendo were all very excited about this new system. We were hearing some things about it. Um, our our uh, competitor at the time, Sega, was was giving us a hard time because they came out with the 16 bit bit system first so they were teasing us in their advertising and everything but then when it finally came out and we you know started playing games like like Super Mario World and F0 and, and Pilot Wings uh, you saw the the mode 7 graphics right the the way that graphics could twist and grow on the screen and it was really amazing just to just to see that come to life and to play those great games that came out on it I, I think of that and then uh, all the great RPG games that came out on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System were fantastic um, and and one of my favorite games of all time, of course, so that uh, came out on that uh, was Super Metroid. Awesome. Yeah, that's definitely one of my favorites too. And, you know, for me with Super NES, um, I absolutely wasn't at Nintendo, but I was working for a video game magazine at the time. And um, I was like the lowest guy on the totem pole. I think I basically just had like a 
maybe even at that point an after school job or no, I would have just graduated high school, but it was, um, so one of the, the upper guys, one of the upper writers had uh, a Super Famicom. And this was like uh, maybe close to a year before the Super NES would come out here. So, um, you know, this was my first look at at the system, the, or at least the version of the system that launched in Japan. And he also had with it um, Super Mario World, Pilot Wings, F-Zero, and Final Fight. And uh, I, I was, uh, I just asked as nicely as I could, could I please borrow all this for the weekend? <laughs> and I don't know why he trusted a kid like me at the time with all that, uh, all that gear, but he did. And I took it home and I spent the weekend just kind of swapping cartridges. You know, I'd play Super Mario World for 10 minutes and put in F-Zero and then put in Final Fight and Pilot Wings. And I was trying my best to beat all those games before the weekend was over. And, uh, and they were all really, really amazing. And, you know, you look at something like Super Mario World, which was a great comparison to, you know, Super Mario Brothers 3 had come out not long before that and was an amazing game, but you could really see the leap in graphics and sound and the ability to save your game, things like that in Super Mario World. And then Pilot Wings and F-Zero, like you said, David had, um, those, that kind of that mode seven technology. So for the first time, it felt like you were kind of in a pseudo 3d world where the camera could spin around and show it from any angle. And um, so that that just felt brand new, and I, I'll never forget that weekend of, of you know it was the nicest sunny day outside, but I was just happy sitting inside in front of that uh, uh, a TV, just playing all these games one after the other. So you know there are um, you know a ton of great Super NES games, and I'm sure we've we've all got our favorites, and we'll make sure we we get a chance to to share what all of those were. Um, but I thought it might be fun to start with. Um, with a top 10 list actually that ran a Nintendo Power magazine back in August of 2008. Um, back then they picked their top um, you know, games for every Nintendo platform that had released to that, to that time. And uh, so I have here the, the top 10 Super NES games as chosen by the, the editorial team at Nintendo Power magazine. And I can tell you, I was part of that discussion and um, and uh, the list that, that we're going to run through now is is kind of representative of of compromises that the whole team made. We all felt very passionately about what uh, about which games would go on the list and in what order. Um, so you know everybody has their own list and their own favorite order. And this is this is just what we came up with at the time. But I thought it'd be a great way to kick off the discussion. So starting at number ten was a game called Super Castlevania Four. Um, Sam, is this a game that you ever had any experience with? Oh, yeah. Um, and it absolutely deserves to be on that list. It would be on my personal on my personal top 10 also. You know, coming off of the excellent Castlevania games that were available on NES, um, you know, story-wise, Super Castlevania 4 is really kind of a remake of the first game again in, an, in, in sort of this, like, new 16-bit styling. Um, but... One thing that that is so memorable about that title is the soundtrack. Um, I think with the with the new sound capabilities of the Super NES hardware, they were really able to to create an atmosphere and set a tone that was very unlike what they had done on the, on the previous generation hardware on the NES. I mean, you had this sort of a, this melancholy journey, but you also had those just amazing Konami tunes that they were well known for also. So yeah, I I recently played through, well, I say recently, within the past two years, I have played through uh, Super Castlevania 4 again to to completion, and it absolutely holds up. I, I, I adore that game. Yeah, I agree, Sam. I mean, that is a fantastic game. I hadn't, uh, I haven't played it as recently as, ha- as you have, but uh, I, I agree that sound, you know, the the the, uh, the great sound that was in that game and the music and everything really set the creepy tone and and set the stage for the game. I also like the, um, you know, sort of layered backgrounds and graphics that that you could see in that that gave it this, you know, a, a depth to the to the visual experience. Um, and then the ability of the Super NES to to have boss characters that were that were so much bigger than you saw on the NES. You know, I really remember that game. It's the smallest detail, but for whatever reason, it, it, it I always have to do it every time I go back and play the game, is where you could just sit there and crouch down and kind of hold out your whip and just kind of freely shake it up and down <laughs> in any, any direction and make the whip just kind of, you know, go around like crazy. And if someone just happens to walk into it, they take some damage. That was uh, that was a little thing. Uh, that That's that funny. was that, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, that was useful for taking down some of the enemies where you're, you didn't want to have to rely on your personal timing 
to to get the the whip attack just right. You could just sit there and kind of flail it, and um, and enemies would come to you. You wouldn't have to worry about of going to them. Absolutely. Well, moving down the list at number nine was Super Mario Kart, and I should just uh, I just remembered I was going to mention that uh, you know a lot of these games, um, a lot of the best games, honestly, that came out for Super NES are available now um, to Nintendo Switch Online members. Uh, you know, there's a collection of of NES and a collection of Super NES games that total over 100 titles. So if people haven't had a chance to try out some of these and they sound like they might be pretty cool or or if uh, maybe you did play it back in the day and would like to go back and re-experience it, heavily recommend um, checking out Nintendo Switch Online. Um, you can even get a free, you know, seven-day membership if you just want to, you know, really go have some crazy long weekend and just squeeze in as many games as you can. But Super Mario Kart, again at number nine, is one of those games that when, uh, at that time, like I said, I was already in a magazine, and we would basically end every day playing this game, and we played battle mode endlessly. And uh, it really was a new type of experience, similar to F-Zero in a way, not as fast, but with more kind of complicated courses with more obstacles and the ability to kind of attack other racers. Um, you know, it's crazy to think that before that game came out, we didn't have Mario Kart, which has been such a, you know, dominant game series on every Nintendo console that's come out since then. Um, but, you know, David, what was it like the first time you experienced Super Mario Kart? You know, it was... It was um just a real fantastic experience right because you had you had the the graphics that looked you know um so much brighter than you've seen on the nes and and uh just being able to experience the the racing competition and this game is so iconic you know it's 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 uh you know gone on to have many different versions and it's sort of like the the game that brings everybody in right everybody can pick up and play mario kart and and i love that about that game um we also did some uh some after work uh playing of mario kart um it, at nintendo you know we had some great uh great battle modes you know some super balloon battles uh that uh that we had some fierce competition in yeah office bragging rights are pretty big with that game for sure oh yeah sam how Sam, how about you? Were you big into Super Mario Kart back in the day? My memories of Super Mario Kart were getting my butt kicked. Um, it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't a game that I owned when I was younger. So my experiences were playing it at friends' houses. And, of course, because they owned the game, they were much better at it than I was. So I didn't stand a chance against them. It wasn't until uh, like, like later entries in the series when when I got copies of my own that I really got competitive at all. But uh, I, d I did enjoy playing it. You know, the multiplayer aspect was obviously like one of the one of the biggest things about about Super Mario Kart. Because, you know, you've you'd seen some of those those mode seven rotation effects before in in F Zero, because F Zero came at launch. But F Zero was a single player game. So now you have the ability to to race your friends in Super Mario Kart and, you know, attack them with different items, you know, collect the coins. And like David mentioned, there's that battle mode which Man, there there were some there was some fierce competition. Maybe some friendships ruined as a result of that. <laughs> but but what a good what a good time. Absolutely, and it still holds up. It's a, it feels a lot different than today's Mario Kart games. But uh, if you go back and try it out, um, it's still a lot of fun. And I think that's true for a lot of Super NES games. I think they hold up really well. Um, and that's certainly true of our number eight game here, which is Super Mario World Two: Yoshi's Island, which to be honest is a game I kind of. Um, didn't fully appreciate initially. Um, maybe it's because I went into it, you know, thinking if this is a true sequel to Super Mario World, it, it's it's very different. You know, it had kind of these, um, uh, you know, this very stylized look that was unlike anything I'd ever seen before that, that looked very childlike, but at the same time just really appealed, I think, to all ages. It was just so creative. But um, I went back and revisited the game a little bit later and really appreciated it for what it was. And now since then, it's become one of my favorites. Yes. Yeah, I agree. But that crying baby Mario, you know, you just didn't want that to happen, right? I mean, uh, I, I just remember that that was just such, you know, the thing you wanted to avoid because because that crying noise was just, uh, I don't know, it, it was kind of a, a little bit annoying, um, a little bit frightening, you know, you didn't want you didn't want the uh, the baby to be taken away. But uh, but yeah, that game w was great, you know. Not only did it have these incredible visuals, but it had a lot of depth of gameplay in it as well. 
That's right. Yeah, the little bad guys who float in and try to carry away baby Mario who rode on Yoshi's back. And and I really played that game. I didn't just want to beat each level. I wanted to get 100%. And, and there was a lot of stuff to collect in every level. And um, one of the things that was you really needed to do if you were going to do that is to avoid having baby Mario carried away mm -hmm. um, because that kind of affected uh, your final score. So... Um, so yeah, that uh, that was definitely stress inducing for me hearing that cry. That's that's precisely why I have not finished that game to this day. Not because of the cry, <laughs> but because of what you were talking about before about this drive to want to beat every stage and collect everything along the way. Um it had this uh this kind of unique design where you had two sorts of gameplay. You could play through the stage normally just to reach the end, and that was its own kind of challenge. But if you played through the game with, the, with an eye toward uh, collecting all of the, the red coins, all of the flowers, and making sure that your, um, that your counter was at, was at maximum in order to get 100% you know, completion credit for completing the stage, it became this completely different game where suddenly you're spending all this time in these stages looking for these these cleverly hidden secrets and and I love playing the game that way but I get I get so bogged down in kind of the minutia of like trying to to maximize my my runs and my experience that yeah I I I still haven't completed um, Yoshi's Island 100% to this day. I'm, you know, I should, I should work on it. You should. And, you know, just for the experience of seeing everything the game has to offer, that's one of those areas where, you know, no one's going to, uh, blame you if you want to, uh, you know, use some of those, uh, those features with the Nintendo Switch Online collection where you can rewind if you take a hit, you know, skip back in until before the, uh, the damage was done or, or even, uh, you know, basically, uh, use a suspend point to save your game, you know, at basically any, any step of every level. Um, so, you know, that's one way you might consider just kind of uh, making things a little bit easier for you, maybe a little less stress inducing if you want to just check out the rest of the game. I need someone to constantly remind me that those features are there uh, because I <laughs> I play a lot on original hardware. I'm, I'm one of these folks that still has like all the original consoles hooked up and ready to go at a moment's notice. And because I switch back and forth between playing on the original hardware and playing on like a Super NES Classic Edition or um, on Nintendo Switch Online, uh, I, I switch back and forth a lot. I, f I forget that a lot of those extra features are there. So th thanks for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is a great reminder. I mean, there are so many great features on Nintendo Switch Online, you know, that we didn't have those advantages playing through the first time. But uh, but it is great to be reminded of that. Yeah, they're definitely there if you need them. Um, then at number seven, we've got Contra 3, The Alien Wars, my personal favorite Contra game. And, you know, Contra is, is a great kind of legacy series, but for people who weren't necessarily playing games back in the NES and Super NES era... Um, might, they might not realize just how dominant that was. Like if you went over to a friend's house and you wanted to play NES, you're probably playing Contra. And then when this version came out, uh, it just blew, uh, blew everything out of the water, in my opinion. You, you're holding on to missiles and kind of shooting at bad guys while you're like flying through the air, grabbing a missile. You're um, you know, riding your, your sci-fi motorcycle through an apocalyptic wasteland while you're blasting enemies. There was just so much over-the-top action in this that uh, it felt like the, the best, wackiest sci-fi action movie that we never actually got. Yeah, I agree. What a, what a showpiece for the hardware, too. I mean, uh, you, just, just looking at that first stage, you know, you, you start out on foot, you, you, get a, you collect a couple of awesome weapons. About halfway through the stage, you get into a giant tank. And then you blow away some enemies in the giant tank. And once the tank explodes, then you jump out and this awesome, you know, kind of mode, I don't know if it's exactly mode seven, but this awesome effect where this, this airplane charges straight toward the camera, drops a couple of bombs, then there, then the whole stage is engulfed in flames. You make your way through that. And then at the very end, you fight this giant screen filling turtle like enemy. I mean, that's all just in the first stage. And it was just un unbelievable to behold at the time. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. I mean, just the, the the look of the game and the feel of the game, the intensity of, of going through, you know, going from side scrolling stages to some stages where you had the overhead perspective, the use of, of mode seven graphics, you know, as you're saying, Sam, I think it was a, a, a great game and certainly, uh, you know, 
a, a good part of this list. Absolutely. A real action classic for sure. So at number six, we have Street Fighter II Turbo Hyper Fighting. And um, Street Fighter II back during the Super NES era, and whether you're talking about the uh, this version of the game or the original Street Fighter II uh, cartridge that came out for Super NES, nothing was bigger. Like uh, Street Fighter has continued to be obviously a, a kind of a dominant series in gaming, but um, you really had to have been playing games back in the 90s to understand just how huge it was when it first exploded onto the scene. And you know, I can remember for the first Street Fighter II on uh, Super NES, kind of uh, knowing that it was going to come out soonish. So every day I was just calling like every store in the area until one day I found a store that had it. And I like got somebody to quickly drive me over there. And then as I'm getting out of the car, I see a kid coming out of the store holding his copy of Street Fighter II. And I'm just thinking to myself, please let there be more in there. I hope that wasn't the last one. And then, of course, you get the cartridge. And then from then on, you know, whether it be for weeks or months or for me, it was years, that just became a cartridge you always had ready to pop in when a friend was over. If you just wanted a quick Blanca versus Guile match. And then, of course, this version of the game, Street Fighter II Turbo Hyper Fighting, added uh, an increased speed, more characters, and some other features. So it really was kind of the height of, uh, of fighting games, I think, on the Super NES. Well, yeah, and a lot of people, you know, met that game in the arcade, and, and uh, it was great to be able to ha have that kind of experience at home, and all those classic characters, Ken and Ryu and, and Chun-Li and, and everyone else, it was just amazing to have that kind of a, of a um, fighting game that you could play at home. I uh, love that. One of, one of my favorite games of all time, probably uh, Street Fighter Two, but and specifically the version that you that you have on the list, uh, Street Fighter Street Fighter Two Turbo. Um, yeah, my first uh, like like David was saying, my first um, experience with Street Fighter uh, Street Fighter Two was in the arcades. Um, you know, my parents would go to the the YMCA twice a week to to go work out and play volleyball, and then we would we would end up in their like little teen center. And in their teen center, they had uh, an arcade cabinet for Street Fighter II. And that's, you know, I wasn't, I didn't, I was pretty young. I didn't have a pocket full of quarters at the time. I couldn't spend too much time with it. But I remember, you know, those, those moments that we did get to play Street Fighter II were, were really special. And then when we found out that it was coming out on Super NES, um, we were, it was actually, we were in Blockbuster. And we saw it, you know, uh, for, for rent. And so we rented it. My brother and I took it home. We, we played the mess out of it. We got all the way up to M. Bison. But, you know, that game doesn't have like a save feature or anything like that. So we probably weren't supposed to do this. But we, we left our console on for like the next three days for the remainder of the rental period because we didn't know if we'd ever be able to get back to Bison. And we just kept coming back to it and trying to beat him and trying to beat him. Um, and and I, don't, I can't remember if we ever actually did. But uh, that's that's one of my favorite memories of Street Fighter Two. Uh, we never actually ended up owning owning the first version though. It was Street Fighter Two Turbo when that came out. That was the one that we eventually got, and um, it's I've it's kind of kicked off a lifelong love of Street Fighter from from that moment. That's so funny, yeah. Sam. You know, I'm leaving the console on. That's just so classic old school <laughs> save, right? I mean, um, before before games had built in saves, that's what folks did. Is you just didn't unplug it, and you made sure that nobody in the family would touch right, it because right. you didn't want them to upset your save file. That's what you had to do. Yep. There are games I couldn't have beaten otherwise, like the original Mega Man. You know, I would just <laughs> leave these things on all night so I could sleep, then I'd get back at it Saturday morning or something like that. But yeah, Street Fighter II Turbo Hyper Fighting. Um, you know, people don't remember too, or, or, you know, people who weren't around playing games back then won't know that, uh, you know, there really weren't fighting games before Street Fighter 2. Obviously, there was the original Street Fighter, but it, it was quite a bit different and didn't really catch on, certainly not to the degree that, that the sequel did. And, you know, there were some games like Karate Champ or what have you before that that kind of looked like a, 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 a two, you know, a, a, a fighting game. But, but it really was the modern fighting game was kicked off with Street Fighter 2. And I remember looking at it as, as a person who, you know, had never experienced a game like that before. And to me, it was like, oh, they just took basically the boss fights of a game and cut out all the, <laughs> the filler, you know, all the filler enemies. Yeah. And it's just boss fight after boss fight. And each character could do so many different things. Um, so I, I still kind of get that when I go back and play those original Street Fighter II games, I think. I still remember how, how impressed I was. Do you guys have a main? Have a, have a anybody you favor in that game? You know, in, in that version of the game, or actually 
for the original version of Street Fighter 2 as well, I, I played pretty much, I cycled through a lot of people. I guess I keep coming back to um, Ryu just because, um, I don't know, he's just kind of a good standard character to me that uh, has, is pretty all around. But I used to like to play Blanca a lot too and try to zap people. Nice. I was just going to say that. I like Blanca. You know, he's green, <laughs> he's big, he's electric. Uh, it was a lot of fun when you when you powered up and people would run into you and, and get zapped. Yeah, I've, I've certainly never been a great Street Fighter II player with any iteration. I played it mostly as like a casual fan, but but uh, I think everybody, uh, whether you were necessarily a quote unquote you know hardcore fighting game fan or not, back in that era, everybody played Street Fighter II. Oh yeah, absolutely. The first release of the game, Street Fighter II, when it came out on Super NES, you couldn't play as the boss characters. Uh, you couldn't play as as Balrog, right. as Vega, as Sagat, or as M. Bison. And it wasn't until Street Fighter II Turbo um, came out on Super NES that you could that you could play as any of those fighters. So like, when I first started playing the game, I, I was really trying to learn Guile, um, uh, but I wasn't really that good with him. So then I, I picked up Ryu a little bit later. But uh, my my brother, he was he was once we got Street Fighter Two Turbo, he was really big into both uh, Vega and Bison, and and he's still a, a big time Vega player to this day. Yeah, and that was also you know there was such great competition at the time between Super NES and Sega Genesis, kind of like you noted before, David. And I remember with Street Fighter Two in particular, there was kind of a war of Street Fighters where. You know, uh, Super NES got Street Fighter 2, then Sega Genesis got Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition, I think, where you could play as those boss characters. Mm -hmm. But then it, it swung back to Super NES with Street Fighter 2 Turbo. So uh, it was uh, it was really fun to kind of see that back and forth. And, and I enjoyed all versions of those games. All right, so moving on to number five on the list is Chrono Trigger. And, uh, you know, I think something that has to be said about the Super NES is it had a lot of really amazing, um, you know, Japanese RPGs. Um, and that really was kind of the, the console era where I was most into those kinds of games. And um, Chrono Trigger was one that really stood out because not only did it have this immersive story and this really cool kind of time traveling hook to it, but it also had this, this uh, kind of action-based um, combat that wasn't as, you know, um, it wasn't what you're used to uh, from JRPGs at the time, which are more you know, turn-based. Uh, so it really stood out and was just an amazing game and obviously continues to have an incredible fan following to this day. Yeah, I agree. I, I played the heck out of that game when it came out. I was um, uh, working on Nintendo's power line at the time, and essentially the power line was was a recorded FAQ, uh, a, a voice-recorded walkthrough of the game. Um, before people could access things on the internet, um, the ways to get information was either to, you know, look in a magazine like Nintendo Power Magazine, talk to your friends, or or you call Nintendo. Uh, and uh, we had two kinds of, of help for people that called in. We had a live uh, agent called a gameplay counselor who could answer your questions. And then eventually we developed these recorded walkthroughs. So I, I was working on this one and, and just remember hours of playing the game and going through and, and getting every ending. You know, they had multiple endings as you play through those. Um, just a really fantastic game that had so much story and, and so much depth to it. I, I'm so I'm so mad at myself for missing this game at the time. Um, you know, you, you, when I, I was I was a little bit younger, and so I didn't have access to everything. I certainly tried to remedy that. Now I'm I'm a bit of a collector. I buy a lot of uh, Super NES cartridges and and all that. Um, but I I didn't have Chrono Trigger at the time, and my only exposure to it was again at friends houses and i could see that there was there was this amazing adventure there and there there was there was so much to to discover and explore but you know when you're over at a friend's house for only a couple of hours you don't you don't really get a a, a good sense of what that is so it wasn't until the nintendo ds release later that i picked up chrono trigger and had the opportunity to play all the way through it and and now it's, yeah, it's it's a top 10 game for sure. I was the exact same way. Like I, I missed out on it at the time and was aware that people were really res responding to it uh, very passionately. But it wasn't until Nintendo DS that I really dug into it. And I was like, ah, oh, it really holds up. I see what all the fuss was about. And uh, moving on to the list, we've got uh, number four is one of my all-time favorite Super NES games for sure. One of my all-time favorite games, period, Super Metroid. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid and I played the first Metroid game, that was at a time, I think 1987, before we really had game magazines, or at least, at the very least, before I was was kind of aware of them and reading them. 
and there was no internet, obviously, so you had no idea what was going to come out. Um, I think maybe you had Nintendo Fun Club newsletter if you subscribed to that. And uh, and I was at Toys R Us, and and uh, back in those days, when you were looking uh, shopping for games on on the game aisle, they didn't actually have the games uh, packs for you to just pick up. You took a little ticket to the cashier, paid for it there, and then you went to this little booth area past the checkout aisle where inside this locked booth area was like just stacks and stacks of games. It was like, you know, the the Scrooge McDuck treasure room <laughs> games if you were a kid. I was going to say, just like, did you ever peek your head back there and just imagine what it would be like to be amidst all those games? I know, to be the person in charge of all those games. But that's what I would do, actually. I'd kind of like look really close because the whole thing was, you know, kind of glass. And I would try to see sometimes if there are any games that were stacked up on those tables back there that I didn't see out that had been put out on the aisle yet. And that was the first time I saw Metroid. It was this stack of silver boxes. And I'd never seen the silver box game before from Nintendo. So I thought, ooh, right away, this must be special. And um, based on basically that alone, uh, I got the game, took it home, and was just blown away by um, this new type of action game that was a great uh, action game but had all of this exploration. And the whole world was kind of like this big interconnected puzzle. And it really drew me in. But what I didn't realize at the time, until you'd played Super Metroid, you know, in between there had been uh, Metroid 2 on uh, on Game Boy, but that was very much a scaled down experience for that platform. Um, so when you got Super Metroid and they introduced a map, which it's hard to re- believe it now, but if you go back to that original NES Metroid, there's no mapping feature. Super Metroid had just amazing graphics, like all this extra atmosphere and the music and everything. It really was uh, just that original idea perfected, in my opinion, at the time. And um, that became just one of my favorite games that I've, despite, you know, it's a fairly lengthy game, fairly sizable world, but I had to run through and get 100% of all the missile tanks and energy tanks. And and I've been through that game several times since. Yeah, I agree. That's one of my favorite games of all time as well. You know, um, just the just the kind of you know, spooky atmosphere, you're exploring, you're on your own, you have that music in the background that it just kind of is a, is a hint at maybe some imminent doom that is, that is just up around in the next, in the next room. Um, you know, absolutely love that game. I'm a fan of the Metroid series, um, in general, I'm very much looking forward to Metroid Dread that's coming up and, and, uh, absolutely, you know, you know great, great games. I, I played Metroid, uh, um, Metroid 2 as well, and that game was was, was really tricky on the Game Boy. Um, I remember having to really study the maps in Nintendo Power Magazine to to get through that game and to finish that game because of the way that all of the different um, tunnels were connected and there's the water levels that you had to make lower in order to explore further. Um, but uh, but Super Metroid was was just I thought it was off the hook. Just the the you know Ridley and Craid the the size and color of those crazy um, enemies in there, and then Mother Brain the last battle where you think it's kind of over and then she morphs and and you know you have to take her on for the final duel. Just uh, so much great uh, action in that game and memories. Um, and I think I, I I had to play it a few times because there's different endings in that game as well. So love that game. One hundred percent. I don't. I don't know what I could say about Super Metroid that hasn't already been said. That that you two haven't already said. Uh, what a what a standout title. I don't know that I could ever truly answer the question of what my favorite game of all time is. But but Super Metroid would absolutely be in contention. Um, you know, for for all the reasons that you talked about. I mean the the incredible atmosphere. The the way that it. It communicates so much to you with its art and through the environment. Um, the way that it even tutorializes in-game mechanics to you um, through through art. You know, the 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 first time that you need to do kind of the wall jump, it shows you that the animals are sort of running up into their uh, into that that chasm and and wall jumping up there. It, it, it's showing you what you need to do rather than telling you what you need to do. And I can't think of too many other games that were doing stuff like that at that time. And it still stands out as being just this this remarkable achievement, not only for the time, but even coming back to it today, it's it's just stunning. Yeah. Yeah. And just bla- blazing through levels using the screw attack and destroying everything in your path. That what a what a satisfying feeling. 
Yeah, that's true of, of, of really all of the Metroid games. You're constantly getting stronger and more powerful and getting more abilities so that by the end of the game, you're just blazing through areas that gave you trouble earlier on. And it always such a great feeling that you're, you know, you've, you've mastered, you know, something to, to such a level. And, and uh, I, you know, it's been a while since I have played through that game, but I'm definitely planning to do it again before uh, Metroid Dread comes out. I've uh, replayed through some other Metroid games recently. I'm trying to get through the whole series that leads up to Metroid Dread. So moving on to number three is Final Fantasy III, which actually originally was called Final Fantasy VI in Japan. Uh, this is the one that uh, I think a lot of fans will be familiar with. The character Kafka was, uh, was, I believe, the main antagonist in that one. And, you know, this is just another shining example of how many great RPGs there were for this system. Um, you know, complex, increasingly complex worlds, storylines, some real emotional stakes. Um, did either of you guys have a lot of experience with this particular Final Fantasy game? I do not. I'm I'm aware of how well thought of this game is, and that has always kind of elevated its profile for me as something that I eventually need to get around to. Uh, this is something that I that I certainly want to experience myself. Um, but I I didn't play this one at, at the time, and I I know that people that people love it, and even when they consider. The, you know their favorite Final Fantasy games of all time. This one keeps coming up near the top of the list, if not at the top. So, it's it's definitely something I need. I want to get around to at some point. Yeah, I, I remember playing the Final Final Fantasy games. Final Fantasy and the Dragon Warrior games were really my introduction into RPG games. And uh, you know, I remember when they came out when this came out on the Super NES, this and Final Fantasy II, just the music, right? I mean, the, the musical score were just epic and it mm -hmm. drew you into the experience and, and drew you into the storyline. Um, it was, it was, you know, really, really a great experience. Yeah. The world building in this game, um, the story, so many great twists and turns and memorable moments. Uh, it really was epic in every sense of the word. Um, and uh, a great example, like I said, of, uh, of the genre on the platform. Moving on to our final two games on the list here at number two is Super Mario World. And obviously this game came with your Super NES if you bought it at launch and, uh, and I think for a while after that too. And, um, you know, while we touched on it before, but, you know, coming off of Super Mario Brothers 3, which was an amazing game in my opinion, and I think a lot of fans would agree. Um, but then you see the jump from that to Super Mario World with the brighter colors, the bigger character sprites, you know, the, the much, much better improved sound that you could get from the Super NES, sound effects and music. Um, the fact that you could save the game. I think this game still has my favorite um, use of the map screen, um, uh, you know, in between worlds. So, you know, we're going to get into this game a lot more in a little bit. It's going to be our featured game in the Nintendo Power Game Club segment. But just very quickly, you know, for a lot of people, this was the, their first experience with Super NES was with this game. Sam, what was your first, uh, you know, kind of experience with Super Mario World? I mean, I, I talked about it a little bit earlier, but that that was the game that was running in in our Super Nintendo when we when we first discovered it, and and we we played it for weeks on end. Um, there's so much to discover in that game, and and like you said, we'll we'll get a chance to talk about it a little bit a little bit more but uh, the the world itself and how you move through the different areas and how Mario just has this kind of lasting effect and impact on on the environment because as you clear a stage that the path is literally drawn for you and in some cases the terrain deforms to move you along through through the environment I mean it's yeah, I, we'll, we'll, t we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's it's such an impactful game for me. And I think that for as far as 2D Mario games go, this is, it, it could be nostalgia speaking, but it really is kind of the pinnacle of, of 2D Mario um, for, for me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's such an amazing game. There's so many great moments in there. You know, uh, the you have sorts of little surprises when you find a new area or you discover a new hidden item. Um, and and so many great, you know, iconic characters were include were introduced in that game. You know, I was just noticing uh, Charging Chuck, of course, who who who's uh, made his debut in Super Mario World, but we just saw him in Mario Golf Super Rush. 
and he's looking better than ever. So there's just so much packed into that game that that not only was a huge impact at that time, but there's you know we're continuing to see the legacy of that game rolling out in other Nintendo products. Absolutely. And like I said, we're going to talk more about that game in just a few minutes. But uh, to finish off this list, coming in at number one, uh, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. And I don't think that's much of a surprise. I think, you know, everybody could have their own list. You could, there could be a lot of games you could argue for number one. But I think it's hard to argue against The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past uh, as being one of those games in consideration. Because, you know, the first Legend of Zelda game came out and was such a breath of fresh air and a, a, a big new experience on the NES when it, it debuted. This idea that you could kind of go in any direction, even play certain um, dungeons out of sequence. And there was just so much to do and find and explore. Then the sequel to that game on NES, Zelda II, The Adventure of Link, um, was very different. You know, it had a lot of those same thematic elements, but all of the action was now 2D. And... Um, and there was just a lot that that changed from that original formula. Uh, but then when we got to um, The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past on Super NES, it brought back that original style of, of game from the NES, but really just expanded on it with way more content, much better graphics and sound. Um, just everything was taken to you know a higher level with this version of the game. Yeah, you're so right, Chris. Uh, Legend of Zelda is what really drew me in to Nintendo console, consoles. The first Legend of Zelda game, I, I played the heck out of it, and there wasn't really any easy access to secrets and information. Uh, so I'd have to, you know, talk to friends and say, "Well, did you find the candle? Where'd you find it? You know, all the all all the different things." Um, but uh, it was great the way you could explore and you could um, experiment and trial and error and and work your way through the you know that game. And then when Link to the Past came out. Like you said, it was just a, an expansion of that, right? I mean, you had you had all that and more. Um, you, you know, you had the dark world and and all of the different things you could experience there. Um, just a fantastic experience. Oh, certainly. I I keep coming back to the the ability of of the of the Super NES hardware to affect the atmosphere of these games, and in a lot of ways, it keeps coming back to the sound. Um, I, I remember, you know, when you first turn on The Legend of Zelda: a Link to the Past, you're inside of the house, and and you and you have that music playing, but you can hear that that sort of low drone of of the of the rain, and then you first step outside, and then the volume is so much louder, and it's really setting a tone for 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 the beginning of this mystery and this adventure that you're about to go on, and. And what what an amazing experience you get from from that moment. But but straight from the jump, you know that you're in for something special. And I love the way that game, you know, leads you forward in very, very subtle ways. For example, if you're if you're in a dungeon somewhere and you're breaking pots and, and you notice that you're getting lots of arrows. Right. It's like, oh, that's a hint. You have to start looking around for this, the, the switch that will be triggered with an arrow. You know, just very subtle ways that that the game kind of kind of helps you along as you're playing through. Absolutely. And that's another game where, uh, you know, after just enough time has passed where my memory of how to get through the dungeons has started to fade. Mm -hmm. That's the time to play through it again, because it's every time you you go back through it, it's such an amazing experience. So I think a lot of different uh, you know games could have made this top ten list for sure. A lot of different games could have been at number one. Uh, so no disrespect to anyone else's favorites, but uh, I think these are all strong contenders. But speaking of those other games, you know, quickly before we move on, um, you know, Sam, are there any games that you you in particular think we should really give a shout out to that weren't on this list, but were just some some real favorites of yours from the Super NES. I mean, a top ten list is not nearly enough for for a system like the Super Nintendo. Um, you really need like a top twenty five minimum, maybe top fifty to to really get all of the great stuff in there. But um, if we're if we're really if we're really you know picking nits, um, I th- I think I've I've got a you know, uh, talk about Mega Man X. That's one of my favorite titles on the system. It would it would probably need to be somewhere near the top ten, if not in the top ten of of my personal list. Um, I played Mega Man games on the NES before, um, and a lot of similar elements were brought forward for for Mega Man X 
on on Super Nintendo, you know, you still have the boss selection screen where you're selecting one of them, and there's still the mechanic of you know collecting a a, a power, a boosted weapon from from a boss that you defeat, and then trying to find the best application for that to exploit the weakness of the of the next boss. But there were a lot of things that that were added in Mega Man X that made it so much more than those NES titles, in my experience. Of one of those being the way that you could kind of alter the environment by the the order in which you play the stages so if you play if you start off with with storm eagle and you you end up fighting storm eagle on top of this giant airship at the at the end of that stage if you beat storm eagle and then you go into spark mandrel stage after that the the airship from from that storm eagle battle will have crashed into spark mandrel's i don't know if it's a factory or a power plant or what it is but it will have crashed into that area and it alters the environment um there there are platforms that are kind of no longer there there are ladders that are no longer there the power is flickering on and off there's even a mid boss that you fight that uh, has this electricity attack that it can no longer use um, because it can't draw enough power because this this airship has crashed into it. So it really kind of changes the way that stage plays. And I always thought that was really fun. But the other thing that they added in Mega Man X that I loved was the ability to enhance your your capabilities through the for these armor upgrades. So you could get the like the boots that would give you this acceleration ability. You could get the armor that would that have the damage that that you would take. And you know, aside from the boots, which you kind of run into through the natural course of playing the game on on Chill Penguin stage, um, the the other upgrades are pretty cleverly hidden, and you could miss them pretty easily if you're not exploring the stages and using all the abilities that you have uh, available to you. There's there's also like the kind of the super secret um, Hadouken that you can get. You can actually uh, uh, get uh, like reuse iconic or reuse or cans, whatever uh, the the iconic Hadouken and um, if you if you can only use it when you have maximum energy. But when you do use it, it'll destroy any enemy, including bosses, in one hit. So uh, I always find that whenever whenever I get it, it's always this like um, very my my playthrough becomes very precarious after that because I'm trying not to get damaged so that I can continue using this Hadouken to just demolish everything because it's so much fun. I love Mega Man X. That's that's gotta be um, close to the top of my list uh, as far as if we're talking like Super NES greats. How about you, David? Yeah, I think that game was fantastic. Um, you know, that was certainly a fantastic game, Sam. I, I also thought that Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars uh, is, a, is a great game and, and, you know, should be on the top 10 list, at least top 20 list. It, it, uh, it combined just some of the humor of, uh, of the Super Mario world. It was developed by Square, you know, so it had, it had um, you know, that, that RPG feel that they were so great at. Um, great storyline, great music. The, the graphics were really fun. So I think that's one that is certainly on my top 10 list. Um, also a big fan of Earthbound. Uh, such a quirky, funny, weird game. Um, you know, I, I loved the, the characters and, and, you know, the different offbeat weapons and things that you would find in that game, right? I mean, in typical RPG games, you'd have a sword or an axe, and in this game, you'd have like a frying pan. So just the, the wackiness of that game. Um, I, I, I love both of those. I absolutely agree with all of those picks you guys mentioned. And just really quickly, I would add on, I, you know, even though the original versions of Super Mario Brothers 1, 2, and 3 came out on the NES, I love the Super Mario All-Stars collection oh, yeah. on Super NES. That's When I go back and replay those games, that's usually the way I like to do it with the improved graphics. Also, the Donkey Kong Country trilogy, which we really didn't get into at all, but were so hugely important on Super NES, uh, especially the first game when it came out and was so revolutionary with those graphics. We'd never seen anything like that before. And then the music is so infectious to this day. And, um, and then uh, also, uh, I could name off so many more, Act Razor, Demon's Crest, Kirby Superstar, Final Fantasy II, which was Final Fantasy IV in Japan, SimCity, Star Fox, you know, your first polygonal experience for a lot of players. Um, I mean, you guys are right. The Super FX chip. Yeah, Super FX chip, making that possible. Yeah. But just to, to close off uh, for now, because, you know, this is easily something we could talk about for hours, but I think you could make an argument that, uh, and you could make an argument about, uh, for this for multiple, I think, Nintendo consoles, but I think if you're talking best all-time 
video game console, certainly from Nintendo, I think Super NES has to be in the conversation. When you look at the library, you look at the uh, innovations it brought with the controller, we didn't really get into that, but adding shoulder buttons for the first time and four face buttons, which made so much more possible with richer, more interactive games. Um, and then when you look at not just the overall number of quality games, but the fact that some of the most iconic games and some of the biggest gaming franchises appeared on Super NES. I think a lot of um, Legend of Zelda fans would agree that, you know, The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past is one of the best games in the franchise. Super Mario World is one of the best games in the Super Mario franchise. And of course, it's all subjective, but, you know, Super Metroid, another one. You know, I think that uh, it wasn't just that you had a lot of, you know, really solid installments, but you had arguably the best installments of a lot of these franchises on Super NES. So, Again, I really encourage everyone, whether you've played some of these games before or you haven't, to uh, give them a look uh, in the collection that's available with uh, Nintendo Switch Online membership because, uh, you know, we don't obviously don't have all the games there, but certainly many of the of the most memorable ones that, again, hold up great today. And I think even if you're a player who wasn't even alive back in the Super NES era, I think there's still a lot of there, a fun there for you uh, if you check those games out. Now, moving on to the next section, it's Player's Pulse. And a few days ago, just for fun, uh, like always, we posted three polls on Twitter for Nintendo fans. And this time, the questions were all themed around Super NES. And the first question that we asked was, which Super NES accessory was your favorite? And the choices were Super Game Boy, Super NES Mouse, or the Super Scope. Uh, David, for this one, I want to check with you. Which do you think the fans picked? Super Game Boy, Super NES Mouse, or Super Scope? Well, it's got to be Super Scope. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the actual winner was Super Game Boy, uh, and actually pretty uh, it pretty dominating win at seventy two percent. But I agree with you. Super Scope was amazing, uh, especially like that Yoshi's. Uh, I think it was called Yoshi's Safari and Battle Clash. There were yeah. some really great games you could use it with. Super NES Mouse, primarily you just used it with Mario Paint, but a lot of people really fondly remember that game. There was that great fly swatting game in in uh, Mario Paint. Yeah, that they brought back in the first um, Mario Maker, Super Mario Maker. They did, yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, so Sam, the next poll, I'm going to see if you can guess the winner here. Do you use Rewind when playing Super NES <laughs> Nintendo Switch Online games? Oh, the choices were gosh. yes, no, or it's a secret. Which do you think got the most votes? <laughs> Um, uh, I know that, like I said before, I keep forgetting it's there. So now, now this becomes an interesting question of wh whether I think most people remember it's there. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that most people probably, probably, uh, wanted to keep it a secret. Well, that, uh, 22% said it's a secret. 29% said they don't use it, but 50% said that they do. Oh, so wow. Much better memories the... than me. Yeah. Yeah, kudos to the users out there for not only remembering, but being honest about their use. <laughs> I, I try to, uh, if it's a game that I feel like, like Super Mario World, that I feel like I don't necessarily need it on, I try not to use it. But if I'm uh, if I'm getting stumped, a lot of times I'll say to myself, you know what, I beat this game the real way back in the day, so I'm going to let myself cheat as much as I want. <laughs> <laughs> time, time is shorter these days. Time is shorter. Yeah. Of course, then I also play games that I, I never played back in the day, and I'm still using it, so I have no excuse. <laughs> right, the final poll question was, which classic Super NES game would you crown the king? And this is just supposing that we've only given them, you know, four options. Obviously, there could be a lot more. But those four options were Super Mario World, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, Super Metroid, and Donkey Kong Country. I'm going to ask both of you, which, not, not so much what the fans would pick, but which would you pick? Um... Sam, I'm guessing you'd pick Super Mario World out of this list based on what you said before. I, like I said, I don't know that I could ever choose one greatest game, but uh, uh, for me, it would be Super Metroid or Super Mario World. Absolutely. Mm. David, how about you? Super Mario World, The Legend of Zelda, Link to the Past, Super Metroid, or Donkey Kong Country? Gee, Sam, Sam, you're right. It's like it's like <laughs> asking a parent to choose their favorite child. Precisely. You know? it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, my favorite is, is Super Metroid. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan, so yeah. I'll go with that one. All right. Well, Super Mario World got the most votes at 34%. The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past right behind it at 31%. And then Super Metroid and Donkey Kong Country pretty much split the votes after that. Uh, it was very close between them. But um, everybody had a respectable showing. You really can't go wrong with any of these games. Me personally, I 
probably would have gone with Super Mario World if you twisted my arm, but man, that's tough. If you answer, if you asked this question once a year, I bet you would get a different number one every year. Yeah, probably. And it probably also would have something to do with the most, uh, the, the game that I'd played most recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right, next up is Nintendo Power Game Club. And this is the section where we always pick one game for us all to play and discuss, kind of like a book club. And this time, in honor of Super NES, we chose Super Mario World. Now, this was a flagship game for Super NES. As we said before, it came bundled with the system when it launched. Uh, and again, it's also available as part of the Nintendo Switch Online collection. Um, for those who may not have played the game, though, uh, here's a really brief description of it from the Super NES uh, Nintendo Switch Online collection. During a vacation in Dinosaur Land, Princess Toadstool gets kidnapped and a spell is cast on the inhabitants of the island. When they stumble upon Yoshi, Mario and Luigi learn that Bowser is responsible for the terrible misdeeds. Now, Yoshis are trapped in magical eggs that Bowser has hidden throughout seven castles. Many hidden paths aid Mario in making his way to Bowser's castle, completing 74 areas and finding all 96 exits. Discover items, including a feather that gives Mario a cape, allowing him to fly, and a flower that lets him shoot, fire, uh, shoot fireballs in layer upon layer of 2D scrolling landscape. You can even ride Yoshi and swallow your enemies. Now, to kick off our discussion, um, I wanted to share three comments that some fans shared with us on Twitter and Facebook. And first up is Taylor, who said, My best memory of the game was when I first got my Nintendo Switch and I played the game with my Nintendo Switch Online membership. My dad came down and saw me playing it. He shared with me his memories of the game from his college days, and we played it together after that. And Joseph said, uh, this was the first game that I recall having entire hidden worlds and multiple paths. I spent hours just looking through each level for any subtle hint that there was an alternate exit. I also recall the first time I saw a ghost house level, which is now a staple in the series. All of those ghosts floating around really sold the fear for me, and I had to get through them as fast as possible. And then finally, Cohen added, Super Mario World is a timeless classic. My parents bought me the Super NES bundle that came with the game for my fifth birthday, and I never looked back. I still have the locations of all 96 exits memorized to this day. It's the video game version of comfort food. So, David, were you, um, I mean, we talked about Super Mario World um, before, but how would you expand on it now? Like, and, and have you played it again recently? Like, what, what still strikes you about Super Mario World above everything else? You know, it's just the 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 fact that you you are just constantly surprised. You're constantly finding new things and new secrets when you play through that game. Um, I mean, not after playing it through it multiple times, might you might know a lot of the secrets, but just the the first time playing through, there's just so much stuff that's hidden in there, and, and so much um, you know amazing things to discover. Um, I, I think that first commenter is also got a good point because. Uh, it's it's a way to connect generations, right? I mean, you know, Nintendo, the Super NES came out 30 years ago. So there's a lot of those people that played as kids are now experiencing those games again uh, on Nintendo Switch Online, you know, with, with their kids. It's it's just great to see that synergy that, that, uh, that defies generations. Absolutely. Sam, how about you? Oh, yeah. Um, when, when I think about, when I play Super Mario World, which I do probably once a year, um, not all the way through. I play at least probably the first, you know, three or four worlds or three or four areas of Super Mario World once a year. And when when I've been thinking about that game lately, it really kind of brings me back to what was what was different in Super Mario World from Super Mario Brothers Three. Um, like I said before, you know, this, the Super NES was my first console. So um, playing through Super Mario World, you know, that's kind of my touch point for 2D Mario. Um, and, and so when, when I went back and played Super Mario Brothers 3 later, and, and I discovered that, you know, a lot of the ideas that are in Super Mario World were kind of had their genesis in, in Super Mario Brothers 3. You can kind of see where where a lot of um, Super Mario World was was where its foundation was, but then but then you can see all of the things that that got built upon and expanded upon for the, for this new game. You know, in Super Mario Brothers three, each of the worlds was kind of its own zone. Um, you know, it was this own it's its own biome. It had these unique characteristics, but you really didn't get a sense of the way that it was connected to this this larger this larger place whereas in Super Mario World like I was talking about before um, you know the 
Mario's path is built in front of him to kind of lead you through all these places that are kind of smartly connected in, in all these different ways. I mean, you have your water stages, you play those in either little pools or in, in lakes, um, you know, in the, in, you know, the vanilla dome, the, that's where all of your kind of cavey stages are. And, you know, the chocolate mountain, that's where your kind of mountainous stages are. Like everything was, was, was segmented smartly into, into a cohesive piece that made sense. It really gets back to that that Mario world in the title where, where you really kind of p- got to pour one out for Luigi because that's where the brothers moniker got got kind of lopped off and and you didn't see that return for a really long time um, you know you got you had Super Mario Brothers 2 Super Mario Brothers 3 then world and then Super Mario 64 then Super Mario Sunshine Luigi doesn't doesn't really come back into the title of any of these until new Super Mario Brothers on on Nintendo DS. So I, I feel bad for him a little bit. Gotta gotta represent Luigi here. But in any case, back to your original question. Um, I, I I think about the the differences between between Super Mario Brothers three and and Super Mario World and how um, there were certainly secrets to discover in Super Mario Brothers three, but there. It, it felt like in Super Mario World, there was a secret in nearly every stage. I mean, whenever whenever you had that red pip on the world map, that was an indicator to you that, oh, there's more than one exit to this stage. That's something that I, a detail that I didn't know when I was a kid. Um, I could have easily read the manual and probably figured that out, but I, I was a kid. I didn't read the manual. It wasn't until many years later that I knew what was up there. Um, and, and in the ghost houses, you know, there were sometimes multiple exits from the ghost houses, but because you didn't even have that red pip indicator, you wouldn't know that. So there were, there were just secrets layered on top of other secrets on top of other secrets. And it was really the, the first kind of 2d Mario game where, um, where it became about exploration for me. Um, you know, and getting back to what I said about Yoshi, you know, you could still play the game just to reach the end of the stage and you would experience one type of, of fulfilling challenge playing the game that way. But the way I like to play is I like to find everything. I like to really search through each one of these stages, find all the exits, you know, find the keys, take them to the keyholes, uh, that's that's what I love about playing Mario games, and that really was kind of that was that was what was new in in Super Mario World for me. Absolutely, and you talk about those um, those hidden exits. The one that always sticks out into my mind, and this is also kind of an opportunity to talk about the uh, the feather that gave you the uh, the cape power up for the first time in the series. And that was one of those power-ups that was really fun to use, but could be tough to master. Because when you're flying through the air, you know, Mario is constantly kind of dipping his nose down and you kind of press back to kind of lift it back up again. But there's a real rhythm to it. And if you do it wrong, you'll just quickly descend. But if you do it really well, you can kind of keep your elevation for the most part and really kind of, in some cases, skip over a whole level and just kind of come back down at the end. But there was this one spot where you had to get to a, a hidden exit by first flying underneath the, the, the normal goal that would end the stage. So you might think the stage ends there, but to fly underneath that, you have to come really close to the bottom of the screen and it's so easy to just fly off the bottom. But if you could do it perfectly and really time your, your button presses with the cape, you fly under that goal and then come back on the other side and land on a platform that has a secret exit. So whenever I play through the game, I always remember that part and I get to it and I go, oh, I know I'm probably gonna have to do this quite a few times before I nail it. But uh, but it's still um, it just shows how creative and 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 challenging uh, and how much they challenge the player to really explore every nook and cranny of these levels. And then I think nowhere is that more evident than in in the Star Road in the special zone, which that's really when you start digging into the game and they're saying, okay, you've you've managed to to find a secret entrance to the Star Road. Now let's start amping up the challenge a little bit and and you know see if you can if you can hang with us. And then, you know, the Star Road's essentially a star-shaped path in kind of its own separate area of the map. And uh, each point of the star has a different level. And every time you clear a level, then that opens up a warp to a different part of the world. So by the time you've kind of cleared out all the levels in the Star Road, you've essentially got a little hub area where you can warp to any section of the game from. And um, But even that's not enough because once you finally do all of that, then you're given a secret uh, entrance to the special zone, which is like a you know a special hidden area within a special hidden area, and the special zone has its own 
you know, collection of levels. And for me, I'll never forget, um, well, first of all, two things about the specials. On the first is when I just happened to leave uh, leave my character idle on the map screen. Maybe I went to take a bathroom break or grab a drink or something. And I came back and the little uh, steel drum music that plays, you know, kind of showcasing new sound effects you could have with a Super NES, the little steel drum music that plays eventually, if you let it play long enough, switches into like this funky version of the original Super Mario Brothers uh, World 1-1 theme from from the original NES game, which I didn't think that theme was anyway so iconic, but I didn't think it was anywhere in the game until I heard that. And then um, and then the, the second thing, the most important thing about the special zone is I think maybe my favorite memory of playing that game is I'd gotten to the final stage in, in the special zone, which was literally the last stage in the game that I needed to complete. And um, I think the state, this level was called Funky. All the special zone stages had, had kind of goofy names. And so it's really challenging in this level to actually get through the stage in the amount of time you're given. So you're constantly hurrying. And then I remember I was getting close to the end of the stage, clocks ticking down, and it finally got so low that I realized I don't even know where the goal is or how close I am. I just got to book it. I got to run for it. I can't worry about running into enemies uh, who are going to be coming at me from off screen. I just have to throw caution to the wind if I'm going to have any chance of finishing this level. So I just started running. But right about that time, they really didn't throw any more enemies at me. I was just running across a flat plane, and slowly, um, kind of above me, these coins started scrolling onto the screen that were spelling out words. And as I'm running and keeping an eye on the clock, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, I realized the coins are spelling out, you are a super player. And just as I finished reading the complete message, I hopped on the goalpost, just a couple of seconds to spare, ended the level. And I was probably jumping up and down and, and, and screaming. I was so amped at that moment. I'd just done the ultimate challenge in the game, made it to the end, and, the, and the, the developers even took that moment to say to you, basically, wow, nice job. You're a super player for doing this. And that's, uh, that continues to be one of the most magical gaming moments for me. Wow. That's, yeah, that's fantastic. I remember those, those uh, areas in the special zone were uh, particularly challenging. Yeah. That yeah, was, was the ultimate test. It was a gauntlet. I mean, it was it was this this acknowledgement that you had you had seen and done so much throughout your journey that oh you're you're absolutely ready for this now and and they just threw everything at you at at the end in that special zone. And then of course one thing we have to say before we move on about this game we've touched on on Yoshi's inclusion but but to this day you know going back and playing the game here over the past week he's still such a unique feature. I mean, this idea that you're joining your your character with another character that changes how you play, and uh, you know, from being able to swallow up enemies to, um, you know, you kind of hate to admit it, but you know, everybody's there's there's moments when you're playing this game where you realize that you're jumping a chasm and you're coming up just a little bit short, and the only way to make that jump is to sacrifice Yoshi and hop off the saddle and uh, you know, reach reach safety while he plummets to his doom and. You know, uh, to be honest, there's probably a pile of, of Yoshis I've left in, in some of those chasms. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. That's why he's your trusty steed. Yeah, Yoshi was such a fun character. <laughs> yeah, and then the way he adds a whole layer of music. Yeah, and, you know, he could eat apples and spit them out at, at enemies and eat enemies and uh, spit out fireballs. You know, just a fantastic uh, character, you know, that was introduced in this game and then went on to video game greatness on his own. Absolutely. Well, I hate to move on because, again, this is another subject I could talk endlessly about, one of my all-time favorite games. But uh, we're going to move on now to the Warp Zone quiz. And uh, this time we're changing up the usual rules a little bit in honor of Super NES. Uh, This time we're going to have you guess three Super NES games uh, based on a series of clues. And uh, here are a couple of clues that will apply to all three games. First, they were all published by Nintendo. And second, they're all currently available with a Nintendo Switch Online membership. So you guys ready to see if you can guess some games? Go for it. All right. All right, so Super NES game number one. This sequel to our revolutionary Super NES game added Miu and Fei to the team of fighter pilots that returned from the previous game, and it introduced a real-time strategy element to the map screen. But although the game was finished in 1995, it wasn't released until 2017. Any guesses? I certainly have one. I'll, I'll give David a chance. I don't know. I'm stumped. Go ahead, Sam. This is a team team sport, so feel free to shout it out if you know it. Uh, Star Fox 2. That is correct. Star Fox 2. 
was uh, first released as part of the Super NES Classic Edition system. Of course, now you can play it with Nintendo Switch Online, but um, yeah, that that forever was one of those games that people, you know, rumors said that uh, it had been finished back in the day, but shelves and uh, and it was really great to finally see it come out uh, just a few years ago. All right, Super NES game number two. The clues are, this one is another sequel, this time to a classic NES game, and it required a mix of fast reflexes and strategic thinking to take on opponents like Gabby J, Mad Clown, and Bear Hugger, who were some of the largest video game characters that players had ever seen fill their screen at that time. Any guesses? This sequel also brought back characters from the first game, like Bald Bull and Mr. Sandman, and they all oh, competed in the WBA. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Super Punch Out. Yeah, we didn't mention that one before, but that's one of my personal favorites on Super NES. That is a fun game. That's that's another one I didn't own when I was younger, but I saw at friends' houses, and yeah, like you were saying, the the, the characters in that game were so large. It was unlike pretty much anything else on on Super NES the graphics style like they they had so much detail because they were so big on your screen uh, that it really looked like you were playing a cartoon yeah it did at that time yeah it, it was really impressive all right Super NES game number 3 the clues are like Star Fox this was one of the few Super NES games to utilize the Super FX chip which provided the extra power needed to push polygons in races around fully 3D tracks with cutesy coupes, trailers, four-wheel drive, two-wheel drive, and F-type cars. Any guesses? This one's kind of a deeper cut. Yeah, I've, 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 this, this one, I've, I've got it, I think, is, is Stunt Race FX. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. This uh, was called Wild Tracks in Japan, uh, but... Uh, yeah, had a different name here. All right, bonus question. This is an audio only question here. Um, I'm gonna play a sound effect and I'm gonna ask you guys if you can guess what it's from, uh, you know, the action or the game. Um, and I'll play it twice. So if you do know the answer, please hold on for just a minute. And here it goes. And here it is again. All right, any guesses? Yeah, that's a jump in Super Mario World, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's a, the spin jump, actually. Yeah, that was a new move that they added uh, that uh, if you're Super Mario, you can smash bricks beneath you or you can kind of destroy some of the tougher to, to, to beat enemies. So nice job right off the bat. Yeah, I think you can you might it might be the same sound effect. I think you can also hear that in in some instances when you're flying with Cape Mario and and you you hit an enemy it won't immediately uh, like take away your power up. Um, it'll just kind of stop your flight. And I think that that sound effect also plays when that happens. Whoa, that's, if that's true, that's some extra credit right there. I'm gonna have to check that out. <laughs> that's the deep cut there for sure. All right, so now we're gonna finish things off with game forecast. So this is where we take a quick look at some of the Nintendo Switch games that were released either recently or are coming soon. And uh, I'm going to run through the full list here. I'm going to back up for just a second and start with August 11th, where we had Axiom Verge 2 from Thomas Happ Games and Garden Story from Pictogram and Rose City Games. On August 12th, we had Art of Rally from Fun Selector Labs. And on August 16th, we had Road 96 from Digix Art. On August 17th, there was Greek Memories of Azor from Navigante Entertainment and Team 17. And then on August 24th, Hoa from PM Studios and King's Bounty 2 from 1C Entertainment and Coke Media. On August 26, we've got Spelunky from Blitworks and Mossmouth and also Spelunky 2 from Blitworks and Mossmouth. On August 27th, Baldo the Guardian Owls from Naps Team and No More Heroes 3 from Grasshopper Manufacture. On August 31st, we've got Kiwi from Stone Wheat and Sons and Sold Out. On September 7th, we've got Sonic Colors Ultimate from Blind Squirrel Games and Sega. And then on September 10th, Lost in Random from Zoink and Electronic Arts, NBA 2K22 from 2K Games, and then WarioWare Get It Together from Nintendo. And on September 14th, Colors Live from Collecting Smiles and Cruisin' Blast from Raw Thrills and Game Mill Entertainment. September 16th, there's Eastward from Chucklefish and Skatebird from Glassbottom Games. 
On September 23rd, we've got Diablo 2 Resurrected from Blizzard Entertainment. And finally, on September 30th, we've got Astria Ascending from Plugin Digital. Now, that's a lot of games, but it's still just a small sample of the games that have come out uh, you know, this month and, and games that are coming next month. Uh, Sam and David, was there anything on this list that uh, you know, you're especially looking forward to? I mean, how many how many great games can be on a single list that that I'm interested <laughs> in? Like that's it's it's kind of stunning. I I went through and you know I I uh, I watched I've seen trailers for a lot of these and one that really stood out to me was Road ninety six. Um, it's kind of this run based uh, narrative adventure and um, you know I just from watching the trailer. It, it immediately jumped out as something that, oh, I, I think I need to try this and, and see what's going on here. Uh, that and also Spelunky and Spelunky 2. I haven't played them yet, but um, those are those are games that I've been hearing about for years. And I feel like it's finally time to, to figure out what all the what all the fuss is about. Same here. I definitely got to see what all the fuss has been about. David, how about you? Well, for me, uh, I am really excited for WarioWare Get It Together. I'm really excited, you know, to, to see this game and all the multiplayer ways that you can play in this game and, and Wario's crazy cast of characters coming back. It's it's uh, just a great experience. And, and I love that because you can play it in short little bits of time or you can or you can sit down and really dig in and, and get good at all the different micro games in there. Um, that and... And Eastward, um, I'm looking forward to that just because um, I've liked all the other games that Chucklefish has done in the past. This game looks really exciting. It looks like a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to playing that one as well. I uh, couldn't agree more on all those games. They all look really interesting. Axiom Verge 2 is actually one that, uh, you know, just recently released. So I'm playing that now. And, you know, uh, I love any kind of Metroid kind of, you know, action exploration game. And I enjoyed the first Axiom Verge. So that's, that's a lot of fun so far. No More Heroes 3, I've been waiting for for a long time. I enjoyed uh, the first two games on Wii. Um, Baldo the Guardian Owls looks really interesting. Uh, you know, I've only seen the trailer, but the graphics look really cool. Kind of like an animated movie with cell shaded characters and backgrounds that have kind of a lush painted look. And it looks like it might have the kind of puzzles and action that fans of the Legend of Zelda uh, games, you know, might like. So I'm definitely on board for that one. And then Sonic Colors, you know, speaking of games that that we missed back in the day, I missed the original uh, Wii version of yeah. that game. So I'm looking forward mm, to trying yeah. this new and enhanced version. Um, so yeah, so much good stuff and uh, can't wait to try it all, s s assuming I can find enough time <laughs> between that and playing all the old Super NES games. <laughs> That's the thing. There's more games than there is time, but uh, certainly a great list of things. And I think there's some, something for everyone on this list. Absolutely. Well, David and Sam, thanks again so much for coming on the show. I've had a, a lot of fun talking to you guys. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. Anytime. Yeah, thank you for having me. That's it for this episode of Nintendo Power Podcast. If you have any comments or questions you'd like us to consider answering on the show, you can email us at nintendopowerpodcast at noa.nintendo.com. Also, we always appreciate it if you can leave a review, and be sure to subscribe so you get new episodes as soon as they're ready. Thanks for listening, and keep playing with power.